All right, it's time to begin our class this morning. We're on Lesson 8 in our book, The Fashions of This World. Before we begin, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for another opportunity to study Your Word together. We thank You for bringing us all here safely this morning. And we pray that You'll continue with us through this day. Keep us safe and bless us with the things that we need today and every day. Help us to be thankful and help us to um, always rely on You for everything that we need and, and everything that we need to do. And we pray as we study this morning that you will help us to understand your word, help us to understand what you have to say to us about uh, the, the fashions of this world and how we are to fashion ourselves to be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> all right, so I understand that uh, after class Thursday night you guys are all worried uh, about uh, about the world, worried about things that are in the world, and so we're going to have to redo Lesson 7, actually, because Wayne apparently didn't do a good job, he told me. No? No? Okay. So everybody's nobody's worried about anything then. That That's... Okay, that's good. Glad to hear that. Uh, <laughs> now, I appreciate Wayne taking the, the class for me. I had forgotten that we had uh, uh, a function to go to Thursday night. And so I appreciate Wayne taking that on short notice. And uh, I hope that you weren't worried about where I was Thursday night. Um, <laughs> you were? Oh, the lesson failed then. Oh, no. All right. All right. So to, we're, this week we're going to be talking about the fashions of this world. Oh, I just realized we don't have class Thursday night. So we need to try to finish this lesson uh, this morning, if we can, I, I had kind of thought, well, we'll just you know split it up in two. Uh, that's okay. I, I think we can probably dispense with this lesson uh, this morning if I don't get too long-winded on any particular thing here. Um, one thing I will say about this lesson um, how do I want to say this? Uh, a friend of mine recently told me that about being deprogrammed and um, how he um, he spent you know he he was brought up a certain way and, and learned a certain way learned that the Bible taught certain things and is coming to find out that well maybe not. Um, and so he talks about needing to be deprogrammed. I think with this subject, we have, well, with any subject really, we all have the same issue uh, to some extent. And, and we would all do well to recognize that in ourselves and recognize that there are certain things that we learned growing up that we thought well, that's, that's the way it is, and that's the way the Bible teaches it. But maybe that's just the way we learned it growing up. Maybe that's just what we were taught by others, what we were taught by our parents. Um, and we need to be careful to understand what the Bible has to say and understand when we are taking the Bible out of context and understand what is really being taught in the Bible. And I, I say that because there are passages here, and I want to be fair to our author, there are passages used in this, in this lesson related, and, and they're related to this subject, the fashions of this world, and these passages have nothing to do with how we dress. Nothing to do with how we dress. Now, I say I want to be fair to the author. I'm not sure that that's what the author is trying to... I'm not sure the author is trying to make that connection necessarily. I think he's trying to make a point about how we dress, but not necessarily saying this is what the Bible says about how we dress. Um, so, and, and at first I was really mad. I was really upset this lesson. I was like, what? What are you doing? And then I read it again. I was like, oh, okay, well maybe that's not what he's trying to say. Um, but, but I still want to cover that because I think it's not the first time that I've heard these passages used. And the first time I heard these passages used, 
uh, that is that was the point. It was to say this is what the Bible says about how you dress, and so we use the we have these guidelines that we go by. It's like no, no, you've completely missed the point of the passage. Okay, so that's my my opening rant, and I, <laughs> forgive me, forgive me for going on that rant, but uh, hopefully you'll understand what I mean as we go along. All right, so the fashions of this world now. Our author does uh, points out at the beginning, in the introduction, that you know you can talk about fashion in a couple of ways. You can talk about fashion, and I use this in the prayer. You can talk about fashion as in how you mold yourself. Um, and uh, he points out in First Peter. Let's read First Peter one verse fourteen. Uses it uses it in this way. Um, And uh, read, someone please read verses 13 through 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope on the grace to be brought to you, the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written... You shall be holy, for I am holy. Okay, so, uh, New American Standard, correct? Okay, so that says conformed. ESV says conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Ignorance. The King James says fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. So there's this idea of how you conform, how you mold. You're molded, basically. Yes. Now, there's a fire and then he fashions it Right. Okay. All right. Right. So, so what we're 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 not really focused on that, although we kind of are, uh, because what we're talking about when we talk about the fashions of this world, we're talking about the manner. Uh, we're really talking about the manner of dress of the of the world, um, and we're talking about fashion as you might see in a in a fashion magazine. You know, you look at the pictures and you see the fashions that are there. What is the world putting on? What is the world presenting to us as acceptable uh, garments, acceptable clothing? Um, but, so, so what we're trying to understand is how should we fashion ourselves in how we wear the fashions of the world? Um, do we fashion ourselves according to the world? And wear what the world wants says we should wear, or do we fashion ourselves in a different way, perhaps according to what God says? Yes. Answer that question. Yes and no. Yes and no. Okay. Paul Paul indicated that uh, basically when in Rome he took control. Mm-hmm. There were certain times he conformed with the custom place and talked about the covering of the custom. I believe he was talking about a custom that took Part. Mm-hmm. And it was unseemly for a woman to enter into any sort of worship. Mm-hmm. Well, the woman needed to go to propriety, custom of the area of living. Mm-hmm. But in other areas, that may not be the custom. Uh, same thing with many other things that we have. For example, the Indian. Uh, when we pour the, the uh, juice in our cups, we use full strength grape juice. Mm-hmm. Over in India, they cut it with water because grape juice. Very expensive. Mm-hmm. And really, in New Testament times, they cut it with water. Mm-hmm. So, so that was their custom. Our custom is different. Mm-hmm. Uh, our custom is to use a sort of a cracker. Their custom in India is to use the roti, the soft bread. But it's an unleavened bread. Right. So there are certain things that we do conform to custom, which are matters of indifference to God. Mm-hmm. Then there are other things that are customary that are not matters of Right. Okay, exactly. So so what we want to do is look at what does matter to God and and use that as a guiding principle for how how we deal with the fashions of this world. Okay? Um, so Right. Okay. Exactly. So, so this is where this is what we're getting to. Uh, the author points out at the uh, toward the bottom of the first page here, uh, 
of our lesson. Too many merely reflect the current mode or popular styles surrounding personal appearance rather than moving cautiously by viewing them in light of scriptural principles governing a Christian's appearance and behavior. So that's what we want to avoid is just going with whatever the world uh, presents to us and saying, well, that's, that's fashionable, that's what I'm going to do. All right. So our, our first section here is that styles send signals. And he makes the point that clothes may not make the man, but they do reflect the man. Now, he, po- he points out James chapter 2. And this is where I started to say, uh-oh, what are we doing, what are we doing here? James chapter 2. And someone read verses um, 1 through probably 7 would be good. My brethren, do not hold your faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, but there also comes in a poor man with dirty clothes. And you pay special attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say, You sit here in the good place, stay with the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made the distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you were called? Uh, go through verse 9, actually. Get that. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, but love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as present. Okay, thank you. So that last verse, I said to go through verse 7, but really verse 9 kind of finishes the thought. That last verse does finish the thought that this passage is about showing what? Partiality, okay? Does this have anything to do with dress? How, how we dress. Yeah, you can't show partiality over the way someone is dressed. <laughs> okay, exactly. You can't show partiality over the way someone is dressed. It, it, every single time someone has made a rule about what you should do church, they have violated this aspect. Okay. <laughs> All right, yes. Uh, so, uh, so um, but but the, the point the author is bringing out of this passage is, look, look at what they... Uh, what do they look at when they determine, well, this man's rich? Or this man's poor. What do they look at? How he's dressed. Okay, so that's that's the point that he's trying to make. Is that when we when we dress a certain way, we convey a certain image uh, to others, and they and they make judgment calls about us. Is that important? Well, it could be, depending on on what we decide that image should be. Uh, okay, so rich, poor, no, that doesn't matter. But there are things, you know, we need to think about what image we are portraying to the world by how we dress. Okay, that, that's, and that's all we're trying to say here. Um, B is one may signal an attitude toward an occasion. All right, now he points out in Genesis 41.14, I'm, I'm not even, even going to turn there. Genesis 41.14 when uh, Pharaoh calls for Joseph to come and interpret his dreams, it says that Joseph uh, shaved himself and changed his raiment, put on new clothes to go to Pharaoh. Okay, what does that say to you? That Pharaoh didn't want him wearing his clothes. Okay, <laughs> right, exactly. That Pharaoh... Right. Now, here, here's the thing. This is where I start. Okay, let's let's go to the next passage, Matthew 22. Matthew 22 is the big one. This is where I really got. Oh my goodness, I could not believe that this passage was even being brought up. Um, and th- this is the one I've heard used before. <sighs> Completely. Well, anyway, we'll we'll read it. Uh, someone read Matthew 22, one through uh, what is that? 14, please. Jesus spoke to them in parables, and the king of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, who were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat and livestock are all butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. 
They paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. Perhaps he seized his slaves and mistreated them. But the king was enraged. He sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways. As many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? The man was speaking. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are called. And so we learn from this passage that we should make sure we dress properly when we come to church. No, when we come to church potlucks. When we come to church potlucks, right? <laughs> okay. So, so th- this is where I this is where I had the point of contention because I thought that's what the author was trying to teach us from this passage because I've heard this taught before from this passage that this passage shows this passage proves that there is a w- certain way that we should dress when we come to church. Is that what this passage is teaching? Yes, Mark. Yes. (laughs) Go ahead, Mark. Here it is. Okay. What this passage is teaching is the way this man was dressed, not show honor to his husband. Okay. Now, whatever that means, that's all it means. Mm -hmm. The way we dress when we come to church is good for us to honor the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, if that means that I'm wearing a clean, like my father had when he was growing up, a clean shirt he got every Christmas and a clean pair of overalls. And in the wintertime, they wore shoes. Summertime, they didn't. Couldn't afford them. But have them all year long. Or does that mean that we're wearing a three-piece suit with a gold watch chain hanging out of it? You know, I, Urban Lee talked about this congregation that he preached meeting for and their preacher was a premillennial preacher. There are premillennial members of the Church of Christ called Bolites. He was a premillennial. And he had his nice three-piece suit with his gold watch on. They thought he was great, their preacher. Mm-hmm. They would not call on this one brother to lead prayer because all he had was a white shirt and a pair of overalls to wear to church because mm-hmm. he was a church farmer. Mm-hmm. Now, to him, that showed honor to the Lord and he gave the Lord what he that's, that's all that's talking about. Mm-hmm. Now, what does that mean for me and for you? It may be completely different. Okay. So, okay. there you are. All right. Now, so, so to your, to your, this, your story about the, the congregation, that's a complete violation of James chapter 2. Absolutely. Correct? All right. Now, all right, uh, Mark, uh, Wayne, sorry, Wayne, did you have your hand up? Well, I think that you know there, there's some problems with you know, trying to didn't use the phrase "give God your best." So I'm not gonna, but you know, I have heard other people use the phrase "give God your best" mm-hmm. when it comes to the kind of blood. Frankly, that's a lie because if you, people who say they give God their best in the way they dress would spend more money on their clothes, or they would wear their wedding clothes to every single church service. I've never seen anybody do either of those things. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, it's hypocrisy to claim you're giving God. And when I go to India, I don't wear a suit and tie mm-hmm. because that would be out of place. Mm-hmm. You know, and in fact, the way I see it, the way you dress has nothing to do with what how God perceives you, and everything to do with how you're trying to by others. The reason I wear a suit and tie here is because people perceive me a certain way when I teach. I don't want them to take me seriously, and they won't take any other parts of me seriously. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's hard. You're not a serious person. It's so, good that you know. You know yeah, that. You have yeah. to have this that. Uh, but you know, when I go to India, it's, it looks overdressed. It's going to intimidate people. It will affect people's perception of you. The way I see it, dress is about becoming all things to all men. You know, God. God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. Mm-hmm. That means, you know, as far as I'm concerned, when the heart is right, the clothing, you know, is irrelevant in that respect. But. Again, the heart needs to be right. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So, and and what you just talked about there is exactly why Joseph changed his raiment because he uh, he needed to present himself to Pharaoh in the way that Pharaoh expected him. 
Yeah. Right? Um, what, what clothes did he have access to? Yeah. Other than what was provided for him. Right. Right, exactly. I, I heard, saw a hand back there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so if we think about this, he says that this is the kingdom of heaven. This is a parable about the kingdom of heaven. Who, who is the king? Like the king is giving the wedding feast. Who do you think the king would be in this parable? Jesus, God, right? Okay, so who is prepare, who doing the preparing of the feast? He is. His, you know, he, he's preparing this feast for everybody and he's inviting everyone in. Who's being invited in to the kingdom? All right. Okay. Right. Now, but first, but first he had certain people he invited, right? Who would that be? The Jews, right? So first, you know, God chose these people, the Jewish nation. He chose them and He invited them to be His people, right? And what, what did they do? He, yeah. yeah. And, and what did they do? They rejected it. They said, yeah, pff, whatever. You know? And, yeah. And not only that, they seized His servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Right? Is this not what what Israel did the to the prophets? Right? And so the king was angry, and then he goes out. And he says, "Bring them all in. Bring them all in. Go out." And they go, and it doesn't say they went and handed out invitations. What did they do? They gathered them. They brought them in. Right? Brought them in. So, to your point. Did they have an opportunity to go home and change clothes? No. So, so this is, I've always had a problem with this parable because I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They went out and gathered all these people and here's a guy that doesn't have wedding clothes on. How can he be mad? I mean, he wasn't wearing wedding clothes in the street, right? I'm interested in your explanation of that. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. So, uh, Wayne, I think you had your hand up. So let's think about you know the, the overall context of that mm-hmm. Jesus is talking to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the context of the Jewish leaders, who are the first people that are invited to the kingdom of God? The Jews. The Jews. Right. right. Exactly. And when they reject him, which they do, they're opposite. And he says, "Okay, now you know I go invite all these other people. I'll just invite everybody." Right. Probably. The Gentiles, it's safe to assume, nations of this world, are all the Gentiles going to be saved? No. And I think that that is, you know, inherently the point, you know, to some degree, when we get to verses 11 through 13, is that no, some of them will also not make it in the kingdom because some of them just aren't clothed for it, some of them aren't right for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, in verse 14, makes the point, drives it home, why, what, it, why people, some people are rejected. Many are called, but few are chosen. God okay. invited everybody to this feast, but not everybody is going to be welcome at this feast. All right. And so, you know, how does God choose people? Well, it's not because of the lack of room at the banquet hall. Right. The reason God chooses few isn't because, you know, well, there's only so many seats available, guys. It's because you weren't prepared for this. Right. Okay. And and, th- and that is the key to this whole thing. And so my question about, well, how could you expect him to be clothed properly? Well, that's kind of a side issue. The fact is, he was expected to be clothed properly, and he wasn't. He was not prepared. Okay, now, so here, here's my point about this passage, is that nothing of what we have said is really about clothing. It's all about being prepared for the kingdom. It's all about being called, being chosen, being prepared. And if you're not prepared, 
you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it to the feast. You're not going to be able to enjoy that joyful time with the bride and the bride uh, and the bridegroom. Okay. So to to use this passage, and and I'm going to tell you this: our author is not using this passage this way, but to use this passage to say, look, you must be clothed properly when you come to church. I think is taking it out of context because um, I, I don't I don't think this has anything to do with how we dress now what it does have to do with and what our author's point is is clearly this person was he's using the dress as an analogy and so this person that came not dressed properly was conveying something with his dress he was conveying an attitude of not he didn't care about the fact that he was supposed to be dressed in certain clothes. And, and so all he's saying, and really it's, it's kind of a stretch to use it this way, but all, all the author is saying is, we need to be careful about what attitude we convey with our clothing. Okay. Um, yes, I, okay, I saw a couple of hands. Yes. Well, the point is that when we come, to, mm-hmm. we clothe ourselves. Right. Right, right. There's various analogies about the Old Testament actually used here, but that's the point. When we come to the kingdom, we need to convey ourselves as Christians. Yes. And that's more than just the outward clothing that we have. That's also our conduct of life. Right. Colossians 3 uses a kind of analogy of spiritual clothing. You know, put them off. Put off anger, malice, and wrath, and slander, and use the speaking of It's the verb that's used for taking off clothes. You're supposed to put on, verse 12, the heart of passion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. You're supposed to put off these old clothes of wicked act, put on these new clothes of good acts. Right. And which may imply we're talking about more than clothing here, we're talking about character, which is a reflection of the heart. Mm hmm. Okay. Yes, which is the next point, that one may signal certain character traits by his manner of dress. Um, and, and I think this is a good passage to look at. Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 10. Kathleen, you had your hand up. I'm sorry. but. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. So so that would be that would be a portrayal of your attitude toward right. Okay. Um, okay, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Wayne, did you have some? Okay, well, let, let's look at Proverbs 7.10. Um, it says, uh, I'm just going to read it real quick. And behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. So look at what that passage is saying. It's a very, you know, obviously a short proverb. But dressed as a prostitute, that says something about, about our subject here. There is a certain way that prostitutes dressed. In the, in the time that this was written. And it says, Wily of heart. And because of her dress as a prostitute, you could tell it, it said something about her. She was wily of heart. Okay? So, so the, the point here being, what, how we dress portrays something. Portrays something to people. The way this woman dressed portrayed herself she portrayed herself as a prostitute. The rich man and how he dressed portrayed portrayed himself as a rich man. The poor man portrayed himself as a poor man. Okay, so all we're trying to say here is we need to be careful what image we are presenting to the world. Our, what we present to the world should say, Christian, this person is well. Let me let me not say. Let me let me back up just a minute. 
you, you can wear a shirt that says Christian on it. Well, you know, that's not what we're talking about here. People should not look at you and say, that person is not a Christian. <laughs> I think is what we're, what we're trying to say. Because lots of people in the world that aren't Christians, people that are atheists, dress modestly, right? So I don't have to look at that atheist over there and say, well, they're dressed like that, so I need to put something different on. That's not what we're trying to say. What we're trying to say is, nobody should look at you and say, oh, they look like a prostitute. Or they look like, um, I don't know. They, they look immodest, is, is, is the point we're trying to make. They look like they're not a Christian. Does everybody understand what I'm trying to say here? Okay. Because, I mean, again, clothing is largely a matter of part of the fashion part. But the problem is that more Christians, I think, are overtly interested in what other people's clothes say about them than what their clothing says. So, mm-hmm. that, that, that is my observation. Hmm. Good. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah. you see, you know, it's, that, that, that's the thing. What does my clothing say about me? I am a modest person. Or I am with my visions. Those are the kinds of things. Or am I just trying to port it over people and intimidate and impress people? Right. That is my personal thing. Right. Too often, you know, and on this subject, modesty or clothing or whatever, more than any other, I, I observe the blank in the eye versus the speck in the eye phenomenon. It's a problem. And it's a problem with me, too, God was going to say. Right. So, yeah, certainly we need to be, we need to maybe be making this evaluation for ourselves uh, and and understanding our own attitudes and, uh, and character that we're per- portraying. Um, 1 Timothy 2.10. Um, someone read verses 8 through uh, 11, I think. Or, no, through 10. 8 through 10 should be fine. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. Okay, so how is the woman to not dress herself according to this passage? Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, so, 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 okay, so we can focus on but not to adorn themselves. The point is, what are they supposed to adorn themselves with? Good works. Okay. Okay. All right. So, is this is this passage really about dress? It is in a way because it it it's about what do you focus on in your dress? What do you focus on in your life? Really, do you focus on how good you look, or do you focus on how you're living your life? That's what this passage is about. So, so again, you know, this passage really doesn't give us any real guidelines as to how we're supposed to dress. It just gives us guidelines as to how, how to, how to have the proper attitude and how to properly live your life. Uh, yes, Mark. Well, that shell in what the passage really outward apparel, God looks at your inward. Right. Are you are you clothed with Christ? Right. Clothed with Christ, your outward form, but not of any particular value. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're a wealthy person, trust me. Mm-hmm. But clothed in godliness and higher or godliness. Okay. Yeah. If you're if your clothes 
say to you, say, uh, if you're clothes, if you're speaking through your clothes and saying, "Look at me, I'm rich," you have a problem there, right? Yeah. To make a modern analogy, he says so much about the woman quietly receiving instruction, but one of the ways she can not be quiet is by wearing loud clothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, I mean, that word play doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Also, since I think I'm related to part of the name, we don't do what it says in the paper. Oh, we thank you. It, you know, I'm going to, you, you brought up that we pick picking on the ladies. I wish that some lady somewhere would write a, a book or, or a lesson or something on modest dress for men. <laughs> Because, because there are tons of, of books and, 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 and lessons and, and whatever written by men and women that talk about modest dress for ladies, but I don't see much in there about modest dress for men. You know, I, w- I would love to hear some ladies' thoughts on that, because you know, I look at a man and I don't really, you know, nothing, <laughs> nothing's really telling me. Okay, well that, you know. Ladies will look at guys, and I, I see a fully clothed person that that looks modest, and they're like, "Oh wow, oh my," you know. <laughs> and I'm like, well, "What are you looking at? I don't see," you know. So, so it, 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 I think that'd be helpful. Anyway, I, I'll just throw that in there. All right, did I see a hand? No. Okay. All right. I made you all uncomfortable now. All right. So. Um, <laughs> all right. So all right. So let's. So so what we're trying to say is, what we're trying to say is. That it is our attitudes, it is what we're trying to convey to the world uh, that should come from our attitudes about serving God and about who we are as Christians. And so what signals should Christians need to send uh, is the next major point on page 45. We're going to have to go through these real quickly. Uh, Christians, of course, we know Christians need to be seen as lights. Matthew 5.16 says we are the light of the world. Um, <clears throat> we shouldn't be hiding uh, who we are as Christians, and especially not with the clothing that we wear. We shouldn't be burying our Christianity under Im- immodest clothing, uh, immoral clothing. That sends a completely different message. And we talked about uh, being clothed with good works, and I really think that that applies to men and women, um, even though Paul is speaking to the women here in First Timothy chapter 2. Did you have a hand? Okay, so the light of the world passing. When we read Matthew 5, chapter 6, it's Matthew 5 is all about how to do your good works in front of people so that they'll glorify God. Matthew 6 is about how you shouldn't do your good works in front of people because you're just doing it for attention. Okay, right. So, I mean, on the one hand, yes, modesty is supposed to reflect that we are Christians and we're supposed to see that glorified glorify God. But on the other hand, the whole purpose of modesty is to say, oh, look how holy he is. Look how, oh, he must be a he or she right. a super holy person. Right. Point. Yeah, and you've hit on what I was trying to say before that we sh- our dress shouldn't say to everybody, "Look, I'm a Christian," you know. But our, our dress should should not say, "I'm not a Christian." You know, it, it we should be just dressed modestly. Um, right. Okay. Uh, Christians should show, show respect for God's ordained gender gap. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody have a problem here with cross dressing? I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Oh, say it again, I'm sorry. A man shall not wear that with one. Right. He points out in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 22.5 that very thing. That uh, it, the, one, of the, one of the points of the law was a man should wear women's clothing. And, it, and it's more than just being unclean. It says it's an abomination to, to the Lord. Right? So we talk about, well, the old law has been done away with. But if it was an abomination to the Lord back then, it's probably an abomination to Him now. Well, the God Right. Right. Frankly, I think that's the whole point of first the head covering passage. A man should not wear women's clothing and a woman should not wear man's clothing. Uh-huh. Genders are distinguished by the clothing they wear. Right. Right. So it's not like that principle was abrogated. But they all all the men wore dresses back then. Well, the culture defines <laughs> what gender is. That's what right. the head covering passage is. Right, right, exactly. That that is a cultural thing, but we ought to be able to tell the difference between men and women. Is is the is the point? Um, all right. Right. 
Right, right. And, you know, we have, we have even more of a problem today where that's an attitude of the heart now where I have decided that I'm not a man anymore, I'm a woman. And so I'm going to go, I'm not just going to dress as a woman, I'm going to go get everything changed so that I am, in fact, physically a woman. Sort of. Not really. Yeah, now I made you uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> All right, so th- that should not be. And that's more than, than just about dress. That's about the attitude of our heart. You know, God made you what you are, and you should accept that. Um, <clears throat> and you shouldn't try to be anything anything other than that. That doesn't mean, well, anyway, we can get off on that subject. But we're talking about dress. All right, Christians should show that they are governed by modesty, propriety, and moderation. And we've, we've been talking about that. Being clothed with Christ, being clothed with good works. Um, th- this is the principle um, that, that we're trying to understand here. Um, looking back at 1 Timothy... I don't know, we're, we're going we're gonna to skip that. Because uh, I'm trying to get to the one passage that tells us exactly what it is that we should, we should wear. Um, in part D on page 46 and 47. Of course, nakedness is associated with shame. Revelations 3.18 points that out. Um, let's see, Revelation 3.18. He's talking to the church at Laodicea and he says uh, in verse... Uh, 15 through 18, I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot, would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me uh, buy from me gold refined by the fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So, so nakedness should be associated with shame. In, in some places it's not. But it should be. Um, now, that, he's not talking about actual nakedness. I mean, they weren't going to church naked. They, <laughs> that's, not what he, that's not what he means. But he means their, their attitude, uh, the, the way they were presenting themselves. They thought they were in full clothing, but they were actually nakedness. And they should be ashamed. Of that, there are plenty of passages that talk about actual nakedness. Uh, we can look. Uh, one of the big ones is Genesis chapter nine. Well, one of the big ones is Genesis chapter um, three, actually. Uh, so, I mean, it doesn't get any more plain than this, uh, where uh, they give in to the serpent, they eat the fruit, and then in verse nine, uh, eight. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? See, he didn't know that he was naked before, but once he found out he was naked... He became afraid to be presented to God. All right, so Genesis chapter 9 then, 18 through 27. Um, and we won't read this whole thing, but uh, just the beginning of it. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and sold, told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took the garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness when Noah woke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him. He said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. So it seemed like that was pretty important, that Noah's nakedness not be presented. That was shameful, and it was shameful for him to look upon it. All right, so then we can look at... uh, uh, Leviticus 18, 1 through 23 has all kinds of laws about uncovering your family member's nakedness and um, the, the, the idea of nakedness over and over and over again, it's a shame. The nakedness is, is a shame. Now, of course, there it's talking a lot about 
incestual relationships. Isaiah 47.3, Ezekiel 23.10 talks about... Huh? Oh, yes. Oh my goodness, we're out of time. We are completely out of time. Just when I was getting to the part I wanted to get to. Exodus chapter 28, 40 through 42. I want you to look at this on your own. Because there are very specific guidelines for the priest's clothing here. And what they should wear to cover their nakedness. I want you to look at that. And I want you to realize when you look at that, that that this has been used. I've heard a preacher use this as a guideline for how low men's shorts should be. If men want to wear shorts, they should be a certain length. And this is why. Now, as you're reading this, I want you to understand what he's talking about in Exodus chapter 28. Because first he talks about the ephod. And then he talks about the robe. And then he talks about the underpants. He's talking about underpants. In Exodus chapter 28, verses 40 through 42. And he gives strict guidelines for the underpants of the priest. So is that something that we need to... Is that is that really telling us what our... Uh, what are, how low our shorts should go? Is that really a guideline for us to use for for modest dress? No, this this was cl- underclothing that he's talking about. So my my point is, and and I'm going way over time here. My point is, we need to be very very careful. We really want to have guidelines. We really want to have, you know, we want to have patterns. We want to have. Something that tells us, okay, how can I be right? So that there's no question. I don't, I don't really have to think about it too much. This is what the Pharisees wanted. This is why the Pharisees created all of their laws that went way beyond the law of God. And Jesus rebuked them for it. We need to make sure that we're not doing the same thing when we talk about subjects like this. Let's have the proper attitude as Christians and clothe ourselves with good works and clothe ourselves with Christ. And then coming out of ourselves will be the proper dress. We will know what to do. We will know how to dress modestly. We will know how to present ourselves to the world if we're, if we're trying to think and act like Christ. And so... Lessons like these are are important to think about, but let's not go beyond what the Word of God actually says and tells us to do. Okay. All right. We we really have to stop. Sorry. (laughs) Thank you for your attention. Um, And we will uh, discuss Lesson 9. If you want to talk about this more on Sunday morning next week, we can, but uh, otherwise we'll start with the selfishness of this world, Lesson 9, next Sunday. So you think we covered it? (laughs) Yes, we covered it.